Hey, I'm Jake. I make RPG supplements and videos about Pathfinder 2, or Pf2. I love Pf2. And as a longtime player of D&D and a lot of other role-playing games, I want to share with you the things I find along the way that are fascinating or just strange. Or even crappy. Today, continuing the Undead Archetype series, we're going to be talking about the ghoul. And touch on the Lacedon. There's going to be a point at which that I'm going to have a time on the screen so you can skip ahead past the undead benefits if you don't want to hear them again, because it's in the other undead archetype videos. Ghoul! Source Book of the Dead. I'm going to be reading a lot of flavor text in this, so if you want to skip it, well, good luck, because there's a lot of it. But if you want to get right to the stats, you can skip right here. Okay. You died from the necrotic disease known as ghoul fever and rose anew as a ravenous ghoul, forever craving the flesh of sapient creatures. While you... sapient means, um, aware and intelligent. While you can temper your hunger with long dead flesh stolen from ancient graves, you much prefer devouring those who are freshly dead, whether as a scavenger or because you killed the creature yourself to ensure a fresh meal. Whether they stalk through the graveyards and crypts of Galarian, or work together with other ghouls to build empires in the Darklands, ghouls care most about the consumption of dead flesh. It's kind of their thing. The moment you become a ghoul, your existence focuses upon satisfying this endless craving. Ghouls who go more than a few days without feeding on freshly dead humanoid flesh find themselves in constant pain. Those who go for more than a week might be driven to the edge of delirium, becoming bestial in their craving. I find that specification interesting. Humanoid flesh. So you can't just eat a bunch of freshly dead raw animal meat. People. Things. You have to kill walkie-talkie people. And eat their faces. And intestines. <clears throat> When you succumb to ghoul fever and become a ghoul, you don't lose your mind or memories. You keep your personality only to have it warped by the never-ending need to consume flesh. A brave warrior remains brave, but under the curse of the fever, the, that brave warrior's prime directive is to consume flesh. A rogue might go from finding clever ways to pick pockets to finding ways to waylay opponents and devour them. I find that interesting because, like, I don't think much about ghouls most of the time in, like, movies or video games like it's usually zombies who completely lose their minds or vampires who have like full control of their faculties ghouls are like a mix they're a blend between the two it's like you are you but fucked up it's like you if you were a serial killer or maybe you're already a serial killer and so it's easy for you to imagine that maybe you're a worse serial killer is that a thing since most societies don't allow cannibalism, ghouls who wish to continue their old lives must satisfy their cravings in secret, finding a way to balance society's rules while feeding the constant gnawing hunger inside them. Some take up professions that allow them to se secretly eat dead flesh or create dead bodies to feed upon. Create dead bodies. Interesting way to say, kill the shit out of people. <laughs> there are tales told of ghoul mercenary troops who satisfy their cravings and profit, while well, ghoul spellcasters can use their magic to procure and preserve flesh. Ghouls who won't restrain themselves with rules of the living may join or establish ghoul societies. These caste systems base their hierarchy on how much flesh one has consumed and can provide for other ghouls. You know, so, you know, your, your basic, like, democratic society. Hunger and ambition drive ghouls to rise through the ranks, which allows them to feed their hunger even more. Yeah, sounds like capitalism. Okay, so they're basically Americans. I'm picturing a ghoul eating a cheeseburger now. I think that totally fits. So before I get to the dedication, I want to focus on the sidebar about role-playing a ghoul. When playing a ghoul, think about how hunger will affect your personality. Perhaps keep your character's personality as close to its original intent as possible, but with a slight twist. The desires and cravings of a ghoul are certainly strange and inhuman, but if you start emphasizing that right away, you don't have room to grow your portrayal of the character's descent into this hunger. So you want to leave room to devolve. As you get more ghoul feats, you can roleplay your character's diminishing aspects as ghoul-like characteristics emerge. As your character becomes more ghoulish, they lose old inhibitions and become more ambitious. Ambition, after all, is another sort of hunger. Adding these new ambitions gives you ways to portray the transformation besides just making your character a cannibal. I think that the ghouls, while like in myth and also in like old versions of D&D, it was... People who 
kill and eat gluttonously. Not necessarily cannibals. And then it became people who are cannibals in myth and lore, uh, game lore. And so you don't have to choose any specific, like, you don't have to choose to be a cannibal or to just eat raw meat. Like, you can play it as just, you are extremely vicious all the time now. And it comes out in all sorts of ways. Like, I can picture an Old West gunslinger becoming a ghoul and not really changing much. Still just being a vicious desperado shooting people for money. Just maybe also eating their eyes afterward. Now, the ghoul dedication. I'm going to read the entire dedication, and then I'm going to zero in on the traits, and that's when I'll show you a point to skip to if you want to skip the basic undead benefits. Ghoul dedication, feat 2. Rare archetype dedication, book of the dead, page 48. Prerequisites, you were killed by ghoul fever. I find this interesting because... Pause! Alright, I'm going to be pausing constantly because that's how I do it. If you're... If you die from ghoul fever and you become a ghoul, you're carrying ghoul fever. Even if you don't have the ability to, like, spread it. So if some creature bites you, they should have a chance of contracting ghoul fever. Like, I mean, a vampire, obviously, that wouldn't matter. But, like, a wild animal. Make a bear ghoul. That'd be interesting. Bear ghoul companion. You have succumbed to ghoul fever, dying and returning as a ghoul, an undead cursed with a never-ending hunger for dead flesh that slowly overrides your reason and willpower until you would do anything for the meal you crave. In addition to the personality changes, your body changes as well. Your ears become pointed, and your skin grows bluish and pale. Your fingernails sharpen into claws. Your teeth become razor sharp, ready to tear flesh off the bone. And your tongue grows long and pointed. Not just like you can narrow the end. It's like bone. You gain the ghoul and undead traits and the basic undead benefits. Your undead craving is for the flesh of dead creatures. Freshly dead corpses from sapient creatures fulfill your cravings much more than non-sapient or rotted corpses, but any dead creature can stave off the hunger for at least a little while. You gain two unarmed attacks in the brawling weapon group. The fist unarmed attack... Sorry. The first unarmed attack is a claw that deals 1d4 slashing damage with the agile and finesse traits, and the second unarmed attack is a set of jaws that deal 1d6 piercing damage and have the finesse trait. You gain the Consume Flesh action. Satisfying your craving is difficult. Consuming flesh temporarily satiates you. Many ghoul feats have extra abilities or functions that can be used when you are satiated, though using those abilities also causes you to lose your satiated status. Like you use your hunger exerting yourself, so you make yourself hungry again. Or more vicious, you know, depending on how you're role-playing this. You can always consume flesh, but eating more than a normal amount has no further effect. A ghoul's hunger is satiated or does not. And I would default as, like, unsatiated in any situation. If you're not sure, just assume that you're hungry and probably a little hangry. Like, that's probably a good way to relate to it. If you're somebody who gets hangry, just picture you at your hangriest. And then maybe plus that. But, like, your ghoul's default is that hangry. Which sucks. Anyway, consume flesh. One action, manipulate. Requirements. You are adjacent to the corpse of a small or larger creature that died in the last hour. Effect. You devour a chunk of the corpse. You become satiated for one hour. Special, you can't select another dedication feat until you've gained two other feats from the ghoul archetype. So, like I mentioned with the zombie, you can carry around a corpse for up to an hour, because it has to have died within the last hour, and then you eat it again later, and you, like, extend that satiation by another hour. It's just a handy little trick. You can't just, like... Actually, I guess you could. If you're a vicious jerk, you could... Higher NPCs to just go along with you. It doesn't say they have to have a, number, a certain number of hit points or a certain level or a certain constitution or anything. You just hire somebody for, join me for the day, 10 gold, 100 gold, just for one day, and then eat them and take the money back. Sounds easy enough to me. And you know, there's no alignment anymore. So you can do whatever you want. I think that's what that means. <laughs> Okay, basic undead benefits. Skip to here if you've already heard it. Basic undead benefits. What you gain as becoming undead differs from what monsters get for being undead because your player character has to be rebalanced for you. Necrol. You know the necrol language. You also gain undead vision. You gain low light vision or you gain dark vision if your ancestry already has low light vision. 
You get negative healing. You are damaged by positive damage and aren't healed by positive healing effects. You don't take negative damage and are healed by negative effects that heal undead, which is amazing. Because, like, you're not going to be running into enemies of people, like, bad guys, who use positive energy effects. They're going to be using negative energy, if either. And I know, it's different now. Because we're talking, like, void and life. Vitality. Vitality and void. Um, but still, people who are evil dickheads are going to be using negative, not positive, so you still make yourself immune to the things you're going to be fighting. It's cool. Negative survival. Unlike normal undead, you aren't destroyed when reduced to zero hit points, which would frankly piss people off really badly. They just wouldn't want to play this. I think. Instead, powerful negative energy attempts to keep you from being destroyed even in dire straits. You are knocked out and begin dying when reduced to zero hit points. Because you're undead, many methods of bringing someone back from dying, such as stabilize, don't benefit you. When you would die, you're destroyed rather than dead, just like other undead. And this kind of makes sense to me as, like, your spirit and your body have been more merged. So, like, you're more self-willed, like you are being driven to stay alive, alert, sentient, mobile. Immunity to death effects. You're immune to death effects. This keeps you from being automatically killed or from having your dying value automatically increase, but it doesn't make you immune to other parts of the spell or effect. For example, you can still take mental damage and become frightened by a phantasmal killer, you just don't instantly die from it. Disease and poison protection. You gain a plus one circumstance bonus to saving throws or any other defense against disease and poison. You're dead. That doesn't make any sense to me. It just shouldn't affect you. Undead hunger. While you don't eat or drink the same food as humanoids do, you usually have thirst and hungers related to your undead state, such as a ghoul's hunger for humanoid flesh, a zombie's craving for brains, and a vampire's desire for blood. Sorry, I said that wrong. Blood. Additionally, while you don't sleep, you enter a state of quiescence for at least four hours a day to recuperate, which lets, which lets your undead flesh re and recover naturally. Many undead choose to rest when the sun is at its highest. Eh, I like it more being like a drive to stay away from the sun, or like you can't stay awake when the sun is up, but okay, fine, whatever. I guess that's a vampire thing. So, now that I've covered the undead benefits... And for those of you who didn't want to listen this time, I'm going to go over my changes to the undead benefits. Haha, <laughs> you have to hear that now. So I'm calling this Jake's Deluxe Basic Undead Benefits. Because I had to revise it, because I just, I want things that make more sense to me and are easier to grasp in world. Because it freaking breaks my immersion if, like, a vampire gets shot with a poison dart and they start taking poison damage and then they fall unconscious. That doesn't make any fucking sense at all. <laughs> <clears throat> so I'm changing them. So this is what I'm using. Feel free to use them. You are immune to the effects of poisons and diseases unless they also have the curse trait, such as mummy rot. This does not prevent you from being a carrier of a disease. In fact, it's more difficult to know if you carry a disease until you pass it on. Increase the DC to detect a disease in your character with the medicine skill by plus four. You do not need to breathe. As an undead creature, your soul is more closely bound to your body, and as such, certain mental conditions affect you more deeply, manifesting as additional physical conditions. While you have the frightened condition, you act as though you also had the enfeebled condition of the same level, at the same level. While you have the stupefied condition, you act as though you also had the clumsy condition at the same level. These are basically the your psyche affects how your body functions because your body doesn't have natural functions anymore it's controlled by your will or your subconscious will and so you feel weak and diminished because you're frightened you're physically weak and diminished because you're frightened it made sense to me and now continuing with level four feet in the archetype replenishing consumption it sounds like a horrible name for a magical disease when you devour corpses and satiate your hunger, you also recover from some of your wounds, your necrotized blue flesh knitting back together almost immediately as soon as you begin shoveling the chunks of dead flesh down your throat. 
Once every 10 minutes, when you consume flesh, you regain 1d6 hit points for every two levels you have rounded up. That's amazing, because you heal through negative healing effects, and your cleric in the party, or your druid, or whoever the hell is healing the party, isn't going to have those spells for you. Most likely. So you need to be able to heal yourself, or just keep yourself from getting hurt. This is amazing and necessary, and something like this should be in every undead archetype. It's awesome. Don't, do not pass go, do not collect $200. Go directly to replenishing consumption. Level four feet. Next level four feet, swift leap. It takes one action. Your undead physiology allows you to leap quickly toward or away from your opponent. You leap. This movement doesn't trigger reactions. If you are satiated, you can choose to end your satiation to instead high jump or long jump without triggering reactions as you take a quick, enormous jump before any foe can react to your movement. That's great. I would probably always use it for the satiated level because the other one is just a little beneficial, but the other one is amazing. At later levels, it won't matter, but you just retrain out of this later. Because at low levels, it can really help your movement in combat, mostly. Or maybe, like, getting across that chasm because your friends don't want you to touch their rope or clothing or magic carpet or anything because you're hideous and you stink. And you might have maggots. We'll get to that later. Level 6 feet. Feverish enzymes. Two actions. Your claws and fangs exude an infectious enzyme related to the necrotic effects of ghoul fever that causes a creature's wounds to heal slowly. Strike with your claw or jaws. This attack deals negative damage instead of its normal type. On a hit, the target halves any healing it receives until the start of your next turn, so they get half the amount of healing they would otherwise recover. The target or an adjacent ally can spend two interact actions to squeeze the enzymes from the wound and remove the effect. Because I'm totally going to volunteer to squeeze my ally's wounds. Maybe if I'm a sadist or if I'm a ghoul. If you are satiated when you hit, you can choose to end your satiation and boost your enzymes, increasing the duration to one minute. I think that it would be better if you could do extra damage with this as well. Maybe a d6 if you let go of your satiation and that... 1d6 extra damage lasts for a minute. I don't see why not, really. It just requires an extra little step to get to some extra damage. Because, like, keeping your opponent from healing a little bit just doesn't matter much. It... Okay. It helps versus things that automatically regenerate. For which it doesn't make any sense. <laughs> like, trolls or vampires. Okay, yeah, I guess. And that's what Ghoul Fever does. It reduces the amount of healing that you can get. So it makes sense, but it's not very useful or fun as a PC. So I, I prefer to just do damage instead of the healing thing. So anyway, I don't like this feat. It's thematic. It's appropriate to what a ghoul is. I just don't like it. It's not very useful or fun. Eh, it seems like a waste of a feat. Next level six feet, Grave Strength. Okay, I guess it's Grave Strength, like Strength of the Grave. Not really badass strength. The flesh you've consumed over the course of your existence as a ghoul has made you stronger, gifting you with strange insights from the minds of the sapient creatures you've devoured and bringing you closer to a state of undead perfection. You gain the advanced undead benefits, which I'll go over in a second. In addition, you gain a plus five foot status bonus to your speed while you're satiated. Okay, like aside from the undead benefits, the advanced undead benefits, this is just not great. It's an extra five feet of movement. Okay, that's cool. While you're satiated, which you're probably going to enter combat not satiated, actually. So it's only going to help after you kill somebody and you rip off their flesh and eat it in combat. But advanced undead benefits are cool. You can... Go to this time to skip my explanation of advanced undead benefits, even though you're still going to have to listen to me talk about my version of advanced undead benefits. Dark vision. You gain dark vision if you don't already have it. Greater disease and poison protection. Your bonus against disease and poison increases to plus two. You gain poison resistance equal to half your level. That part's cool. I guess. Paralysis and sleep protection. You gain a plus one circumstance bonus to saving throws or any other defense against effects that would make you paralyzed or have the sleep trait. Anything that would make you have the sleep trait? That's weird. That doesn't make any sense. No, oh, obviously. It's paralyzation and sleep effects and spells. Okay. 
Now my version. It's really not much different. However, you're already immune to poisons and disease, so right there it's pretty different. I'm calling this Jake's Deluxe Advanced Undead Benefits. TM. Immunity to sleep spells and effects. Because why would you just be slightly resistant if you don't sleep? It says you're quiescent. You just sit there twiddling your thumbs for four hours, not being able to choose to sleep. And yet, sleep effects can still affect you. Huh? Okay. You also gain resistance to persistent bleed damage equal to two plus your level. That just makes sense to me because unless you're a vampire, you don't really have blood anymore. You are undead. You don't need a circulatory system. You are powered by necromantic or necrotic negative energy. That's just energy. It doesn't need veins to flow through. Just tissue. Tissue. And if you are a, a mummy, a zombie, ghoul, you don't need blood at all. Maybe vampire would. Okay. However, vampires also kind of make sense that they would heal any leaking blood almost immediately. So the resistance makes sense for them too. So I think this is just better, obviously. So feel free to use that. I am going to, because fuck it. It makes more sense. It's more useful. And it's just easier to remember. <laughs> Instead of, oh right, you only gain plus one against diseases. Next level six feet. Guarded movement. Your guard is up even while moving. You gain a plus four circumstance bonus to AC against reactions triggered by your movement. That is useful. It is. It, um won't really come up that much. I wouldn't spend a feat on it. I almost said waste a feat. It's not necessarily a waste of a feat depending on your circumstances. This is otherwise a monk feat, which is kind of cool that you get the maneuverability of a monk as a ghoul. Cool. But most of the time this just isn't useful. Don't take it. And like, if you take a little bit of extra damage, you can blame me. Well, that guy, you know, from the YouTube, Jake, he, he's an idiot. He said that I wouldn't need this, so I shouldn't take that damage. Go watch this video. Here it is. It'll work, I promise. Next level six feet. Reactive Pursuit, which is normally a rogue feat. Trigger. An adjacent foe moves away from you, and you can reach at least one space adjacent to the foe with a stride action. You keep pace with a retreating foe. Yeah, reactions are cool. This is a reaction. You stride, but you must end your movement adjacent to the triggering enemy. Your move does not trigger reactions from the triggering enemy. You can use reactive pursuit to burrow, climb, fly, or swim instead of stride if you have the corresponding movement type. That will come up later. Awesome. I mean, if you're playing a ghoul, you are a melee character. There's not really a good reason to be a caster and have all these extra melee attacks and have to be adjacent to a fallen enemy to eat their flesh. I mean, you're going to be melee. That's that's what the ghoul is for. That's what they're best with. And so being able to move along with an enemy trying to move away to get away from you because you're fucking terrifying. Uh, great. It's great. Take this feat. It's useful. Your party members, your friends will thank you for it because you will be occupying and distracting the enemy. Now we're into level 8 feats. The ghoul feats are so cool. Paralyzing Slash. Two actions. It's, it's incapacitation and occult and necromancy. Prerequisites. Feverish enzymes, which sucked, so I think you should just be able to take this without feverish enzymes because they suck. Unless it does extra 1d6 damage. Talk to your GM. Your enzymes can paralyze your foes rather than merely making it harder for them to heal their wounds. Strike with your claw or jaws. If you hit a living non-elf creature, it becomes paralyzed unless it succeeds at a fortitude save against your class DC or spell DC, whichever is higher. Regardless of the result of the save, the creature is temporarily immune to paralyzing slash for 24 hours. A creature that becomes paralyzed can attempt a new save to end the paralysis at the end of each of its turns, and the DC cumulatively decreases by one on each such save. Fucking awesome! Take Paralyzing Slash. Even if you have to take Feverish Enzymes, take fucking Paralyzing Slash. It's great. You just, like, if you, if, if they fail on their save once, they're probably dead. Just fucking dead. Great. Take this. It's, it's like the best feat they have. 
paralyzing creatures is really powerful. Next level 8 feet. Sickening Bite. Your saliva causes severe nausea and mild fever in the living? Like, who cares? Weakening them so that you can more easily finish them off. When you critically hit a creature with your jaws, the creature is sickened one. This is the disease effect. If you are satiated, you can end your satiation to make the target sickened one on a regular hit instead, which is great. Yeah, another really useful one. This is really cool. It's useful. And granted, you're not always going to lose your satiation to do the sickened, but it's a passive benefit. If you critically hit, you make them sickened. Great. There's no save they get. They just get sick. Cool. It's, 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 it's not like an amazing feat, but it's not crap. It's useful. You can take it. Unless you have something better to do with an 8th level feat, which you might, because it's an 8th level feat, it's a pretty high level feat, you know, or other archetypes. Next! Level 10 feats. Flail Tongue. My favorite one. This is my favorite. Your tongue has mutated into a lashing weapon reminiscent of Cabriri's bone-laden flail as the god of ghouls. It doesn't matter. You can use a free action to unhinge your lower jaw and sprout rigid bones from your tongue. You gain an unarmed attack that deals 1d6 bludgeoning damage until you use an interact action to reset your jaw and retract your tongue. You can't make a jaw strike. That's fine. Your flail tongue is in the flail weapon group and has the disarm sweep and trip traits. This is really not that much more powerful than the regular jaw strike, but it's so much cooler. <laughs> and, you know, disarming and trip, good things to have, especially since this is like a weaponless melee character. Although I guess you could just carry a flail. There's nothing that says you can't. All right, fine. Still, it's just neat. It's a nice option. Level 10 feet glutton for flesh. You have developed a capacity to store more flesh within your gaunt body to leave yourself satiated longer. That doesn't make any sense. If you consume flesh while satiated, you become fully satiated. You stay fully satiated for three hours after which you become satiated for one hour. If you're fully satiated when an ability would end your satiation, you cease being fully satiated but remain satiated. If you have grave strength, you gain a plus 10 foot, a plus 10 foot status bonus to your speed when fully satiated and satiated, Jesus, instead of a five foot status bonus for being satiated. That is so fucking hard to say over and over again. <laughs> it just ceases to have any meaning. Uh, so, I don't really see any reason why you wouldn't take this. I mean, granted, it's really just utility, but it's going to mean that you are more frequently able to make use of your satiation losing powers. Because you're just going to be satiated for longer. And you can still carry around a body to extend that satiation. Granted, only an hour more, but still. Yeah, that's good. It, it increases your speed a little bit. It's useful. That's about it. Next level 10 foot. 10 feet. Jeez. Wall run. Another monk thingy. Cool. You defy gravity. Traversing vertical planes as easily as the ground. Straight up to your speed. You must start your movement on a horizontal surface. During this movement, you can run up vertical surfaces like walls at your full speed. If you end the stride off the ground, you fall after taking your next action or when your turn ends, whichever comes first, though you can grab an edge if applicable. If you have water step or similar ability, wall run lets you run along flimsy vertical surfaces as well as vertical liquids like a waterfall. <laughs> this makes no fucking sense for a ghoul, but it's absurd. Why wouldn't you take it? If you have the option, just take it. It's ridiculous and weird. All right, it's really good for positioning. It can be quite useful in a combat because your enemies won't expect you to just run up a fucking wall. Of course, at that level, people can fly. So, you know, it's not all that useful, but it's cool. Level 12 feet. Competitive eater. Prerequisite. Glutton for flesh. <clears throat> the one that lets you store more flesh, which I don't think makes any sense. I think you might like magically convert the flesh that you have into more densely packed energy in your body but like if you are eating flesh and then you eat more flesh and then you use a power that lets you not be satiated and then you do it again all that flesh where to go who cares you can just eat more flesh what 
Anyway, it's, it, it's not stored in your body. It doesn't make any sense. I know, my, my bar for making sense is pretty low. <clears throat> Competitive eater. Gorging on flesh after your stomach is full fortifies you, making you hardy enough to withstand more punishment. When you become fully satiated, you gain an amount of temporary hit points equal to 10 plus your level. This is great. Always take it. Level 12, because it's extra hit points, and you can't be healed. So it's, it's that, or eat people to heal yourself. So this is eating people ahead of time, to heal yourself ahead of time. Level 12, Feet Corpse Stench. It's an aura, olfactory, and it's awesome. Your body exudes an overwhelming scent of decay and a 10-foot emanation so putrid that it nauseates creatures within that range. Any creature that starts its turn in the aura must succeed at a fortitude save against your class DC or spell DC, whichever is higher, or be sickened one, plus slowed one on a critical failure. While within the aura, the creature takes a minus two circumstance penalty to saves against disease and to recover from the sickened condition, which you can also cause in different ways. A creature that succeeds at its save is temporarily immune to corpse sent for one minute. And you can never turn this off. It's just an aura. So, like, just take this. It's just... It's just great. Like I said in the zombie video, you just smell permanently. So that might have issues for you if you're like going into town and you're trying to talk to people. Although if you're trying to talk to people anyway with a four foot long bony tongue, blue flesh, pointed ears, and rot everywhere, you have taken the wrong archetype. That's what that means. <clears throat> yeah, anyway, corpse stench. Awesome. It, it screws over melee. It screws over people around you. So again, this is for melee, which is why you take ghoul. The next one is level 12 feet tunneling claws. Prerequisites, gold, ghoul dedication, and trained in athletics. You have elongated claws and enhanced senses, making you uncanny at digging the underground passageways needed to construct ghoul warrens and rob graves without arousing suspicion. You gain a burrow speed of 15 feet and a tremor sense, imprecise, of 60 feet. Fuck yes. You can burrow through any earthen matter, including rock, while moving at your full burrow speed. That's almost bullshit. That's great. When you move in this way, you can choose either to leave tunnels behind you that are large enough to allow creatures of your size or smaller to move through them, or move through the ground while leaving no tunnels or signs of your passing. This is fucking amazing. Awesome. Helps your group traverse all the shit that your DM GM is going to throw at you. If you're underground or if you're in a building, chances are you're always going to be able to burrow and okay so tremor sense might annoy your dm but it's so useful why wouldn't you take this this has such great benefits and lets you like bypass encounters and traps that your dm put in place which i, I come on face it that's freaking awesome especially if you know that it is trapped you're just like, you know what? I'm just going to dig into the ground before that and then around it. Why not? Solid rock? That's fine! This is cool. I like this. All right. Now, all the rest of the feats require that you are a worshiper of Kabriri. Kabriri is a chaotic, evil, asshole god of ghouls. In order to be a worshiper of him as far as this archetype is concerned, you have to join the church of Cabriri and that cult has to be happy with you. So it means you have to be a sick bastard. I don't care if you call it chaotic evil or not. You have to do fucked up things that ghouls would do. So maybe GMs just allow your players to do this without getting approval from the cult. Because otherwise, that's just going to change their character. Unless they want to go that way, that's fine. But if they don't, and they just want to play the ghoul with the group, then most of the time, it's going to be preventing them from getting these really cool powers I'm about to describe, or making them change their character that they don't really want to do. So I would just ignore the cult or the Church of Cabriri and just say, you figure out how to do this. It's natural. Yeah, it's bullshit. I don't care. It's more fun. So, level 12, Secret Eater. Prerequisites, ghoul dedication, worshipper of Kabiri. You have discovered and found favor with the cult within the church of Kabiri, known as the Secret Eaters. You have maggots that writhe under your skin with the power to wriggle out from between your teeth. 
glean secrets from those you devour and whisper them telepathically into your mind. You have psychic bugs. Once per hour, when you consume flesh, you can select a single intelligence, wisdom, or charisma-based skill whose secrets you wish to uncover. You become subject to the effects of corpse communion, as if you had critically succeeded at casting the ritual. You learn a significant piece of lore, a forgotten secret, or some other tantalizing nugget of knowledge that is of immediate use to you. Awesome! So, like, DMs. I know that it might bother some DMs to, like, have an investigator in the party, or, like, have people who just, the rules say it, they automatically learn things. That is a fucking awesome time to use plot hooks that people didn't find or discover any other way. You can also share behind-the-scenes info and cool, interesting things you did that there's no way they could possibly know any other way. This is more fun for you as the GM. Like, I would almost make them take this. This is great. And it's a huge time saver. Like, at this level, they could cast Corpse Communion anyway if they had a day. But it's, it's just really neat. Take it. If you can take it, it's great. Level 12 feet. Nope. Level 14 feet. Body Snatcher. This has the rare archetype Divine Polymorph and Transmutation Tags. Traits. Your secret stealing maggots reveal how to devour more than just the flesh and secrets of a victim. Because, yeah, that's so little. You can ingest and assume their whole physical appearance. When you consume flesh of a creature of your size or smaller, you can assume the physical form of the creature immediately after becoming satiated or fully satiated. Using Body Snatcher counts as creating a disguise for the impersonate use of deception. Your transformation automatically defeats perception DCs to determine you are a member of the ancestry or creature type into which you transformed. And you gain a plus four circumstance bonus to your deception DC to prevent others from seeing through your disguise. You don't gain special abilities, skills, voice, memories, or other characteristics of the creature you consumed, only their physical form. Unlike Chain Shape, Body Snatcher can be used to gain the appearance of a specific individual whose flesh you've consumed. This effect lasts until you are no longer satiated and can only be used once per individual creature. So, if you're going to do this, you're going to have to, like, keep eating people every hour in order to maintain this disguise for longer than that. Um, it says that you don't gain these skills, but if you're consuming flesh, you can use the Corpse Communion ability to gain some information that they had. So, granted, it's not everything they know, but you can still get something that's important or personal so that you can more effectively impersonate them. Body Snatcher is so fun. This, granted, it's not going to, like, change a whole course of an adventure, but you can do some messed up damage with this or just derail the whole adventure. Or, you know, just make yourself rich by impersonating the, the prince that just got killed that is now sending money to you and nobody knows and come on you can just do a lot of this stuff with this it's great <clears throat> okay next level 14 feet grave shift this has the conjuration divine and teleportation traits frequency once per day prerequisites secret eater requirements you are standing at the bottom of an open grave adjacent to up to four willing target creatures or objects roughly the size of a creature the maggots inhabiting your body impart you with the knowledge to travel from grave to grave? Because maggots know that. <laughs> Draw upon the myst drawing upon the mystical power of the labyrinthine network of magical warrens and tunnels that connect Everglut to the material plane. Everglut is the divine domain of Cabriri. It's just a bunch of graves, basically. You can spend 10 minutes channeling this power to transport you and all target creatures or objects that are inside the grave you are standing into a chosen grave you are aware of, unoccupied or occupied, within a hundred miles. When you target an occupied or fi filled grave, you and all transported creatures and objects appear scattered above ground around the targeted grave or below ground in adjacent tunnels or passageways available. This could be really fun for plot device, but barring that, like, you know, just be fun to, like, let your DM go crazy with ideas. Like, we teleport over here. Do we find any secret tunnels? It's a teleport. It's a very useful group teleport. 
at this level, it's completely appropriate that somebody could do this. And if you are taking the ghoul archetype, you're not a caster. So this is a very nice way that you can contribute to your group by letting them all teleport through graves. And it has that disgusting, rich flavor. It's nice. In that it's nasty. It's a great one. Just, just take that. Level 16 feet. Breath of Hungry Death. Two actions. Frequency once per hour. Prerequisites. You're part of the cult. Whatever. Secret Eater. You have uncovered occult mysteries that allow you to unleash the devastating hunger of Cabriri upon your foes with a single exhalation, releasing a massive cloud of flesh-eating gas that glows with a sickly green light. So flavorful. You deal 76 acid and 76 negative damage to all creatures within a 30-foot cone. Basic reflex save with a DC equal to your class DC or spell DC, whichever is higher. Fuck yes. Once per hour. Every fight. You just spew acid and negative energy. Void. Whatever. A creature that gets a critical failure on this reflex save is also paralyzed for one round. A creature that succeeds at this save becomes temporarily immune to breath of hungry death for 24 hours. It's also a great name of a feat. When a creature is killed using breath of hungry death, its body is reduced to a smoldering pile of ash, wafting with necrotic fumes. We're not done yet. You can use a reaction to immediately inhale these fumes and become satiated or fully satiated as if you would use consumed flesh. You annihilate people in front of you and then you suck in their corpses. <laughs> if this doesn't make you feel like a ghoul, I don't know what would. But obviously, I think it's great. Yeah, you have to be careful because it's an area effect. So what? Casters have to be careful all the time with area effects. It's a 30 foot cone. You can manage the strategy around that. Take it. It's just great. Lastly, level 20 feet, Wrath of the First Ghoul. This has the death, divine, enchantment, flourish, mental, and occult traits. Frequency once per day. Prerequisites, secret eater. You're part of the cult. The ravenous maggots inside you become capable of exploding forth from your attacks into the wounds of an opponent. Whispering telepathic words of destruction that invoke horrible flashbacks of Cabriri's transformation from elf to ghoul. Or psychic images of hundreds of maggots bursting from the victim's flesh all at once. Because of course it would. Make a melee strike against the target creature. If it hits, in addition to taking damage from the strike, the target is affected by a 10th level casting of power word kill. If Wrath of the First Ghoul is used against the target elf, Lang Ghoul, or Worshipper of Phirasma, and does not instantly kill the creature, the target takes double damage. It's just because Kaburi has special relationships with those three, three things. So not only do you toss maggots into your enemy's wounds, they also explode in their mind. This is fucked up, and yes, it's awesome. Like, I want to have a 20th level adventure. I know, maybe one shot, maybe two shots. But then you can do stupidly overpowered things like this. This is wonderful. I mean, this is a great flavor for this archetype. This archetype, like the zombie, did a good job. There's only um, one change that I would make that really needs to be made, and that's that removing the requirement of being part of the evil cult of flesh eater chaotic evil ghouls. Otherwise, you just can't access the higher level feats. And those are awesome. You get maggots that are like godlike powers. So anyway, yes, go with the ghoul. It is a lot of fun and it doesn't really need much changing. I, I mean, like I love homebrew. I love changing things so that they make more sense or so that they're more useful. Yes, I would still change the basic undead benefits and the advanced undead benefits because they just work better and they make more sense. And they're more interesting and they make you feel more like a ghoul more like you're undead so there aren't many abilities that ghouls have that were not included in this archetype the lacedon has like slight variation in that it has paralyzing spew 
So you could include this if you want to. It has the incapacitation trait, occult and necromancy, it takes one action. The Lacedon discharges a spray of carrion vomit at a creature within 20 feet, dealing 1d6 poison damage with a DC 17 basic fortitude save. It also paralyzes non-elves. They can attempt a new save each turn. It's just like the paralyzing slash. It make it, It's easier to save every turn. But this would be a low level version of the super high level spewing negative energy and acid. It takes one action, you can do it every round. Vomiting, paralyzing poison makes sense to me from a ghoul. Because they're kind of all about vomiting and sickness anyway. And disease. I love this ability. I would probably make this similar to the ranged zombie ability, 4th to 6th level. Because otherwise it's just not that useful. It doesn't do much damage, but it's fun, and the DC is pretty low. Actually, you could probably do this at second level. Make it another second level archetype feat. There aren't many second level archetype feats at all, or in general, that are not dedication feats. So you can make this as another second level archetype feat for the ghoul as an option. Paralyzing spew. Not bad. Thank you for watching this. And thank you patrons for helping me out, helping this channel work. Like, we all owe them our appreciation. So thank you guys. If you like the video and you think I've earned it, give it a thumbs up or share this with somebody who's really weird and likes undead. <laughs> Either way, anything you do with this video will tell the algorithm gods that there's something useful here. So, you know, help, help a brother out there. You just, you just tell them it's good stuff. Anyway, uh, you can see more undead videos or other videos on the channel that are also pretty cool. And remember, it takes two skilled people four to five hours to dig a grave. I just thought that was important. Go on, go dig up a friend.